that's, there's no question. That's taken in consideration when you're adding up your cost. I mean, bringing in utilities is part of the cost. And uh, that's, that's what the retail sales or the office rents or whatever you're building has to absorb that, has to find a way to absorb that as part of the cost. All right? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I, with location, though, does location ever trump all of those things if you feel that the potential of that land is worth all the dollars that you might have to put into infrastructure if there's a really high infrastructure cost that goes with it? Does location... I'm sorry, I don't... Does location become more important than other things if you think that that eventual value yeah. is worth all the dollars that maybe would be quite high to have to invest yeah. in? Yeah, well, retail is... Uh, that's what my son Bob is involved in. It's a very unique thing. It actually makes the location. Uh, as an example, being maybe a half a mile or a quarter mile off the interchange is better than actually being on the interchange. Something you wouldn't think about. But it allows the, uh, you, get, you get a magazine of cars that line up. And if you're right on the interchange, you're blocking into the freeway. If you're off the interchange, you're in better location to handle the traffic. And there are basically 32 key days in retailing. And those 33, 32 key days are days that the parking lot will be totally filled. So when the lot is totally filled, and assuming it's been designed to handle the traffic properly, where it's easy to get in and out, and it, and the spill on the traffic, where the traffic gets out, can do it quickly. And so people can find spaces and so forth. Assuming this all works, there are 32 days where that lot fills up. In those days, you want to be such that the backup of traffic in and out of the center doesn't interfere with those people trying to park to find a place to get in and get out. The trip time is important in terms of how people look at a shopping center. If they know that they can get in and out quickly at a center, they'll go buy another center to get at your center. If your parking is efficient, if your shopping is efficient, they're, they're cognizant of it. They're aware that, that it's going to be an easier trip for them, a more interesting trip. Any other questions? Location can overcome. You, the destination that my dad's talking about, you can create a destination that overcomes a location. Mm -hmm. And location can be impacted by that destination that's been created. Mm -hmm. But the, you know, location ultimately goes back to property type and then goes back to what income can be derived by that person using the property. And the location can in fact enhance the income stream because it enhances the desirability of that location either for an office or sales, you know, re retail sales or for uh, the housing location. If it's, the, if it's a great location on, on Fifth Avenue for an apartment, you're going to get a higher value because your view is better. So it, location does matter, but also location can be overcome. It comes back to the income stream. Yes, ma'am. Do you, uh, in a situation in which the owner of the property, the owner of the property has a different vision of what the property could be than what the architect thinks? The, the owner of the property has a different vision than the architect? The, yeah, no. what the architect could have. How, what is the role of the architect in trying, I guess, convince that? When the architect and the owner clash, the owner wants one thing. And what well, well, it's been my it's been my experience that architects are very good salesmen, and that's the time the architect have to sell the owner and his concept. And uh, and I'm sure you're all very good salesmen, and if you believe in what you're doing, if you believe in your art, you'll sell the client, and that's what's important. But you better be right. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Just curious, um, in your 
past experience, especially here, you know, in Michigan, we've run into this, you know, for years. The the, the locale of the place, the location, can be so impacted by the political structure that's around it that I mean, when I, it's probably experience, I guess, but when do you give up? It's like I mean, you, you know, everybody knows it's it, it's so hard to build. With when you make a when you make a large investment, you never give up. <laughs> these are the these are the reasons. These are the allowable reasons that something actually gets zoned and how it gets zoned. Uh, the allowable of zoning, uh, physically possible, is it possible to do it within the confines of the site? Is it financially seasonable? Bobby's point, where is it going to, is there going to be enough rental or enough resale? Is there going to be enough uh, uh, to determine that there is a profit above the cost? And then, of course, it's most productive use, so, all right? Now, here's a question. What is FAR, and how does it impact land use and value? What is FAR? Anyone? Yes, ma'am. Floor area ratio. What? Isn't it floor area ratio? Floor area ratio. Floor area ratio. That's what FAR stands for. Now, we'll, uh, all right. FAR is the ratio of the total floor area of a building to the total area of the site. So, definition, FAR stands for floor area ratio. It's very important because when you build, the ratio of the land determines the height of the building and the density of the building. So, how does this work? If it's a, if it's a one, option A is one, uh, is a FAR one, 10,000 square foot building covers 100% of the site, all right? If it's, uh, if it's a 10,000 square foot building covering 50% of the site, two stories are allowable at a one ratio, right? Now, if you take a one ratio, if you take 25% of the site, you can build a four-story building on that site. Now, FAR1 transferred unused development rights from adjacent lots. Well, we built a building, a couple of office buildings in New York, and one of them, uh, we took uh, we took air rights from the from a church next door. We'll show you that building. Here's the building we built. It's 712 Fifth Avenue, 53 story office building uh, at 712 Fifth Avenue in New York. This is a view from Fifth Avenue. It's a it's a it's a, it's a drawing. There's a church. Right there, there's a church. We bought their air rights. And with their air rights, we were able to build a building almost one third taller than we would have. So we were able to pay more for the site and utilize the FAR. That was how we were able to do it. Now, we'll get it now. Incidentally, Cone Pedersen Fox were the architects on this job. And there's a site. It's within a, it's a f uh, four tenths of one acre uh, site on Fifth Avenue and 57th Street. It's a great location. And uh, uh, prime location allows developer premium rents. Now, look at this building as it relates to the park. And this building. To the, there's a building that sets behind Bergdorf's that's called the Avon Building. It was called, I don't think they call it that anymore, but it was. 57th Street, 9 West. It's called 9 West uh, 57th Street now. And uh, uh, the view, see the Crown Building there? That impedes the view 
of this building to the park, but only up to about the 21st floor. So uh, we built a 28th floor, 27th floor, up to the 27th floor. So we built this building above the 27th floor at a lower, at a smaller building to get it higher, to take advantage of the higher rents. Now, we'll show you this. That's the building, that's the park. Okay? There's the Avon building, and there's Bergdorf's. So you can see our building sits out on the street. You can see the Avon building sits back from the street. And consequently, we have that view of the park. Let's see. Now this, the FAR of a 16 on the base property, FAR limitations on adjacent property due to historic designations, FAR of 8 to 18, per, we purchased the air rights from the adjacent church, significant increase in FAR allowed. Now, what I just explained to you is there's the Crown Building. Winston Jewelry sets as an inset in there. We, they had four floors that they'll never use now. We tried to buy it from them and they wouldn't sell it. So uh, we uh, weren't able to get it. And, uh, and there's the uh, Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church that's next to us. And uh, there's Trump Tower and Tiffany's. You know, there's 57th Street. We're on 56th Street. It's a great location, all right? Now, the site area, that is the four-tenths of one acre, was 17,559 square feet. Within that was a retail area of 85,000. That was Bendel's. That's a floor down and five floors up. And uh, an office area of 458,731 square feet. Total area, 544,648 square feet. That ends up as a blended ratio with the bank of 31.1. Starts out as a ratio of, I forgot how much, uh, 16, wasn't it? Originally? Yeah, 16. Started out as 16. It shows you the advantages of doing that. And that allowed us to build 53 stories. Now, within that space, this is, some, this is the core placement, vacuum fat and maximizes use toward Midtown and Park Avenue, or, uh, Central Park. We put that, because of the size of the footprint, we, we, uh, we put the core back in the corner. The most efficient thing is to try to put the core toward the center of the structure, assuming you have fenestration all the way around, which we did in this instance. But the size, because we went higher, we made the floor sizes smaller under the theory that people would rent one floor. And we did a, instead of doing a 12,000 or 13,000 plate, which we could have done. The difference, give me the next plan. Where's the one with the? Uh, it's coming up next. All right, 53 stories, designing re retail use base, uh, no parking. They won't allow parking in New York. They don't want you to build parking because they want to utilize their, uh, uh, their uh, public transportation. Uh, basement or cellar space, we had three levels of basement in this building. And uh, floor area definition varies in different municipalities. That's, that's, this is New York. They all have FAR, but uh, this is New York's FAR. Uh, 